Um, mostly in the mostly in the solid organ uh, scenario. That's my and then um, I'm happy to have questions probably near the end, um, but happy to happy to discuss. If there are big questions along the way, let me know. Um, I'm this is um, just casual among infectious disease specialists. Um, so I have some disclosures and uh, I always say I like to give a lot of opinions to a lot of people, so I do a fair amount of consulting um, and I will be discussing off-label use or investigational use in my presentation. That's the best part, isn't it? The juiciest. Anyway, I've had the good fortune of being involved in the international guidelines for CMV uh, three different times, and I have worked with several dozen wonderful international um, infectious disease and other uh, transplant related specialists on this uh, topic. So I'm really here today, I'm sort of standing on the shoulders of all of these people who helped uh, participate in guidelines development. As you probably know, CMV is a real spectrum of disease. Um, we see a lot more asymptomatic viremia these days and sometimes CMV viral syndrome, um, but it's pretty rare that we actually see tissue invasive disease. And that's something that's really changed over the past 20 to 30 years where we've gotten a lot better at diagnostics. So it, it is one of what I call the great masqueraders in the transplant field, um, but nonetheless, we've really gotten a much, much better at early diagnosis, early treatment and um, we should not be seeing much tissue invasive disease these days. I do think that, so those are the direct effects of CMV, the CMV infection um, syndrome and, and disease. So the indirect effects of CMV are really significant and actually can have a really negative impact on outcomes. There are higher rates of all types of infection, bacterial, fungal, viral, P higher rates of PTLD, higher rates of cardiovascular events, higher rates of nuanced diabetes after transplant, um, acute rejection, higher rates of mortality across the board, not directly from CMV, but sort of indirectly, and then really negative uh, transplant specific outcomes, as you can see on the right-hand side of the slide. So overall, um, really bad, both direct effect, but then indirect effects. And Paul Griffiths, who's one of the gurus in the field, just wrote a lovely review where they wrote that the total amount of morbidity caused by the indirect effects of CMV may actually exceed that currently attributed to end organ disease. So I always say that optimal prevention and management results in better patient and transplant program outcomes. So it's a real, it should be a real um, focus of any really good organ transplant program. So risk factors in solid organ recipients, the number one risk factor is when the donor and recipient are mismatched, specifically when the donor is CMB positive and the recipient is negative. I always say this is when you're dumping a new virus into someone who is immunocompromised. Um, that is followed by the seropositive recipient and then the lowest risk is the D minus R minus. About 50% of Americans are CMB positive so about a quarter are the high risk D plus R minus, about 50% are R plus, and another about quarter are the D minus R minus. The higher the immune suppression, the higher the likelihood of developing CMV, um, especially when using lymphocyte depleting agents like antithymocyte globulin, and then maintenance immunosuppression is an interesting topic. There's work from Brazil where they've shown that mTOR inhibitor use overall decreases the risk of CMV and might actually eliminate the need for prophylaxis in seropositive recipients. And then on the other hand, baladicept seems to increase the risk of CMV in the D plus R minus um, recipients. So it's important to look at that when you're considering um, protocols in the individual patient. And then there are other things that seem to increase risk, including advanced age, comorbidities, prior immune suppression, uh, leukopenia or lymphopenia, and then there definitely are um, an array of genetic immune factors that we're not really testing for in clinical practice, but do seem to augment the risk of CMV. So just to kind of set the stage of what I'm going to talk about. So a 50-year-old woman undergoes kidney transplant. She is CMV negative. The donor is positive, so D plus or minus, high risk. What question, questions you have? So what is her risk of CMV? Um, so it is significant, probably as much as um, 30 to 50%, depending on how much prophylaxis she gets. She is high risk, so it com compared to other patients, uh, she's at greater risk. What about the impact of CMV? I talked a bit about that, and it can increase the risk of other infections and might decrease her overall kidney function. 
I'll talk more about prevention. And then another consideration is how to think about financial impact. Um, drugs are expensive, testing is expensive, but sort of what are the best ways forward? And I hope to cover all of that in my talk. So there are two main methods of prevention of CMV. One is to give antiviral prophylaxis, usually for three to six months. Most commonly, this is valgancyclovir for three to six months. Another method, um, especially in the seropositive recipients or stem cell recipients, is to do weekly testing for sort of 12 to 16 weeks after transplant. And then once you've reached a certain threshold, it might be 500 international units, it might be 1,000, 2,000, depends on your program. Um, then you initiate treatment. And both of these are fine. Um, and we actually say in the CMV guidelines, it, there, we should think about prophylaxis and sort of you can see the list of different things to consider. And then with prophylaxis and preemptive therapy, you know, weighing risks and benefits, you know, cost, for example, with prophylaxis, you have drug cost with preemptive therapy, you have diagnostic costs. Um, and overall, there's sort of risks and benefits of both of these approach. One of the biggest issues is that with preemptive therapy, you need to do weekly testing. And so you need to have a patient who's definitely going to go for weekly testing, definitely will respond to phone calls, definitely will make it all happen. And then a team that can organize what is a fairly burdensome um, follow up. So in my hospital, we don't usually do that because we aren't as organized as we might want. Nice. So one thing to know about that I just found out about this. Excuse me, could everybody please mute? That would help the rest of us to hear. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so one thing that just came up this week that I heard about is that Genentech, which has provided um, access to uh, Valgan Cyclovir access for patients who need a financial assistance, that program pretty much ended at the end of December. And so we are finding that patients no longer have the resources for patient assistance for Valgan Cyclovir. So actually just this week, we started doing more preemptive therapy because the prophylaxis cost is too significant, often $300, $500 per month or more for patients, which is obviously quite high. So it's even things like that that can change um, what we're doing. In the guidelines, we do give, um, you know, we think about different organs on the left, the serologic combinations, the overall level of risk, and then what we recommend. And say for kidney, we recommend usually for high risk, six months of valgancyclovir or preemptive therapy, either approach or for the seropositive um, recipients, three months of valgancyclovir or preemptive therapy. Um, and hopefully this document, um, which is really written for clinicians, uh, hopefully this is um, clear and helpful to everybody. We will be doing another version of the CMB guidelines soon. What do we do at my hospital? Well, you can see here, we usually give valgancyclovir to anybody with any type of risk. If it's uh, either, Patients that got antithymocyglobulin or D plus R minus, we give six months of prophylaxis. Everyone else gets three months. And if it's CMV negative, negative, we usually give three months of either acyclovir, famvir, or valacyclovir for disseminated zoster prevention. One thing that came out of the second version of CMV guidelines that I really love is the sort of combination approach of both um, prophylaxis followed by preemptive therapy. So you do like three months of prophylaxis. And then for either people who seem to be high risk on higher doses of immune suppression, who have ab low absolute um, lymphocyte counts, or who maybe couldn't tolerate a full course of valgancyclovir, we then follow with monitoring every week. And I do think that not for everybody, but for a subset of the high risk population, this can be quite useful. And we are successfully using this to capture people when they just have a very low level, what some people call viremia, but technically is DNA emia because it's really just um, that we are amplifying virus in blood by PCR. So the technical name is DNA emia, but viremia is another reasonable name. Anyway, so capturing disease early, and I think this surveillance after prophylaxis approach has been um, certainly very useful for me. Now, there are challenges with the antiviral prophylaxis we're using. Uh, the duration of prophylaxis, you know, we kind of say three months, six months, but what about the individual patient? 
There are some cellular immune assays, and I'll talk a little more about this, that can help with duration of prophylaxis, although usually in the seropositive recipients only. Um, another concept is that when people are treated for rejection, we always say that treatment of rejection resets the prophylaxis clock to day zero. And there's data that the absolute lymphocyte count may be uh, useful to, for determining the um, overall uh, optimal duration. Now, leukopenia is another issue, and I'm going to talk more about that. And I'm sure many of you have heard about that with valgancyclovir, along with um, being on trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, mycophenolate, mofetil, um, getting induction, um, immunosuppression, et cetera. And then there's the risk of resistant virus when prophylaxis dosing is too low, as well as significant costs that I've mentioned. And then there's also the whole specter of um, resistant uh, refractory CMB infection. And I will um, talk more about that. Let's, leukopenia is one of the biggest issues we see. Um, so first of all, with leukopenia, really important to make sure the valgancyclovir dose is correct according to the renal function. And it can actually be hard to figure out in transplant recipients what their renal function is. I find most people just look at the computer and say, oh, the computer tells me it's uh, 68, um, you know, whatever the number is, 68 mils per minute or some number. But if you, we, we often are seeing a real disconnect between the creatinine measurement, the cystatin C, which in my experience often estimates a much lower level of renal function, um, but is useful. And talking to transplant nephrology, we often decide to sort of meet somewhere in the middle between the creatinine and the cystatin C. Our patients do have low muscle mass, there are a lot of comorbidities. It can be very hard to figure out their renal function. And I think we often end up overdosing the valgancyclovir because of that. Some programs use a 24 hour urine collection, although we don't seem to be able to organize that very well. And we're always tossing urine, so the numbers are inaccurate. And then some programs have access to a nuclear medicine study. Nonetheless, one of the most important things to do with optimal CMV management um, is to make sure you are dosing correctly as per this, this chart I'm showing you, and to really know their renal function. And that's where I often have lengthy conversations with nephrology regarding what their true renal function is. So if you're seeing a lot of resistance, you're probably underdosing. And if you're seeing a lot of leukopenia, you're probably overdosing. So worthwhile reconsidering how you're evaluating renal function. It is tough. Other things with leukopenia, you can give growth factors like GCSF, um, Sometimes with really bad leukopenia, we do stop the valgancyclovir and then we'll put people on acyclovir to prevent disseminated zoster and do some monitoring um, by um, DNA emia, viral load testing every week. Sometimes we use, um, we don't actually use this in my program, but some people do use CMB specific cell mediated immunity testing to predict the overall risk of developing CMB. The absolute lymphocyte count, as shown by Raymond Razanabli's group, can be quite useful. If the absolute lymphocyte count is over 600, it can actually be safe to stop prophylaxis in that setting. So if you do have issues with leukopenia, you can think about all of those things. Some programs might give doses of CMV immunoglobulin as prophylaxis. That's sort of data from the 1980s and 90s, um, but is reasonable if you really do have to stop the valgancyclovir. And then some switch to latemavir um, prophylaxis in the setting of leukopenia along with acyclovir. Um, and I will talk a little more about the latemavir data that's just emerging. So at um, ID Week this past fall, they actually prevent, presented a phase three randomized study looking at latemavir versus valgancyclovir for prevention of CMB in kidney transplant recipients. And um, basically what they did was use either latemavir or valgancyclovir randomized. Each group got 200 days of um, prophylaxis and uh, they looked for leukopenia and or neutropenia and uh, overall rates of um, CMV disease. And they were adjudicated uh, up through week 52 and I was actually on the adjudication trial for this committee, full disclosure. Although it was extremely blinded, but we were just reviewing cases of CMV. So this showed that overall rates of CMV disease, including syndrome or end organ disease, were quite similar with latemavir at 10.4% versus valgancyclovir at 11.8%. Um, so latemavir was shown to be non-inferior 
And then if we do include investigator reported CMV disease rates, which were higher than the actually adjudicated cases, it was 17% in both arms, so no difference. So latemavir was found to be non-inferior to Valgan cyclovir. Um, so good news. And then if we look at the uh, risk of leukopenia or neutropenia on the left, you can see that latemavir had uh, far lower risk of either leukopenia or neutropenia compared with um, Valgan cyclovir. So pretty, pretty dramatic. Um, and people in the Valgan cyclovir arm about uh, at least 7% used at least one dose of GCSF, whereas it was just about 2% in the latemavir arm. So really a significant uh, difference there with risk of leukopenia and neutropenia in those two drugs. Um, I will say that this is certainly very interesting. Latemavir mm -hmm. is often around $20,000 for three months, and then Valgan cyclovir is expensive but far cheaper. So we'd have to you know, think about the cost. Like, I don't, I don't know that this results in a dramatic change yet. Um, right, and as this uh, presentation at ID Week showed, latemavir was non-inferior for um, prevention in high-risk kidney transplant recipients with lower drug-related adverse events and fewer discontinuations and lower rates of leukopenia or neutropenia. I think there's probably gonna be a strong push from marketing at Merck to use this in kidney transplant recipients. But again, you really have to think about the cost that you're engendering to your transplant program with what is um, pretty expensive uh, medications. But that being said, it's very, very nice to have an alternative for certain patients. Let's talk about diagnostics. So, um, Diagnostics. So most commonly we send CMV DNA or viral load testing on plasma or whole blood. Um, we also do serology, but we really only do serology pre-transplant and it's never recommended for diagnosis of acute disease. We do biopsy of tissues, colon, lung, liver with immunohistochemistry or viral culture um, or DNA testing. And increasingly we're doing DNA testing and moving away from viral culture. Um, you often have to ask your pathologist for special CMV immunohistochemistry testing if you're worried about CMV. And we do sometimes see negative um, blood testing in the setting of gastrointestinal disease. So really important to think about doing a colonoscopy if there are symptoms, signs and symptoms of CMV um, in that that may be the way you diagnose it. Although we actually see this less, this disconnect less now with the really ultra sensitive CMV PCRs. It's been a while since I've seen that. Um, and so th there are these cellular immune assays to predict the risk of CMV. Um, these are sort of similar to what we use for tuberculosis, but measuring a cellular immune response to CMV. These are all, um, almost all of these are not commercially available. The only one that's a commercially available is the CMV T cell immunity panel at Viracore for which there really isn't any significant published data. Um, uh, there is an interesting up to 20 to 25% discord between serology and cellular immune response. So you would think that everybody who's CMV positive would also have a positive cellular immune response, but there is up to a 20 to 25% disconnect between those two, which is somewhat disconcerting. It's probably true that it's going to be more about the dynamics or the trend of the cellular immune response in an individual rather than being like a one and done test like we do for tuberculosis. Really important that we can't compare across these different types of tests that I have listed there. And at present, the sensitivity and specificity are not necessarily at clinically acceptable levels. Um, it does add cost and additional test burden. These are lymphocyte assays, so you need to hand, handle them quickly and adeptly, and so that can be a problem. Um, so I don't really think we're at a time where we're going to be using these um, extensively, especially where they're not really available um, other than on a research level, except for the one at Viracore. Again, not, not a lot of published data on that. How to best predict CMV, late CMV after antiviral prophylaxis? So we actually used the T-spot CMV to uh, look to see um, in both seropositive as well as high risk D plus R minus kidney transplant recipients and we did a heck of a lot of testing and did standard prophylaxis. As you can see here at the bottom of this flowchart, only 44 patients out of hundreds had um, a CMV event, so pretty low. And 
unfortunately, what this showed is that for the moderate risk um, uh, in red, um, sorry, in um, the blue dot, uh, dotted line, you can see that many of them had uh, an overall um, low risk of developing CMV reactivation. And this was actually, oh, sorry. I don't know if you could see that. Sorry, I had some mass general alert about the paging system being down, which is actually great news for me. I'm happy when the pager goes down, less, less calls for me. Um, sorry if that interrupted. Um, so what we showed is that the seropositive recipients, this was predictive, but we didn't really care because they get low, low rates of CMV anyway. And unfortunately, the high risk D plus R minus population, as you can see in red, it really wasn't predictive in that population. So unfortunately, um, huge study, lots of data, really um, they did amazing job, multi-center, multi-country, but still not predictive of the risk of CMV. Um, I'm going to skip this one. Um, Glenn Westall did a really nice study looking at the use of um, quantiferon CMV in uh, for duration of, of prophylaxis after lung transplant, and he randomized for these patients to either get uh, five months of prophylaxis or basically, depending on the results of the quantiferon assay, keep going longer and longer and longer with prophylaxis. Uh, depending on the results, um, and it was a mixed population. Um, uh, about three quarters were um, R plus, and the other were high risk D plus R minus. And he was able to show that overall, based on quantiferon, um, there were better outcomes if they, um, with only a slightly, uh, slight, somewhat increased duration of anti antiviral prophylaxis um, when they used quantiferon to guide the duration of prophylaxis after lung transplant, which is wonderful. Um, you can see that when there was quantiferon-directed treatment, there was an overall lower risk of um, CMV uh, reactivation in that setting compared to standard of care. Um, and not only did he see a lower incidence of CMV infection with quantiferon-directed care, um, there was an overall lower risk of um, uh, viremia and then a much lower risk of severe viremia at 3% versus 50% uh, severe viremia being greater than 10,000 copies per mil. So this did look promising. Um, that being said, we don't have ready access to this, but it um, sure did look quite interesting. If you don't have access to that, as I don't, um, I have found this paper by Raymond Razanabli to be quite helpful, where they look at the absolute lymphocyte count among patients with um, CMV uh, disease, CMV infection, and who did not develop CM, um, any evidence of CMV uh, infection. And they basically determined that there's a cutoff at the end of prophylaxis of an ab uh, absolute lymphocyte count of 610 that if you've achieved at least that level, your risk of CMV is um, much lower. So I actually have an EPIC, I have a dot phrase about the absolute lymphocyte count. Today on rounds, I saw a liver patient who has a very low absolute lymphocyte count. We were about to stop his prophylaxis and I said, no, he'll definitely get CMV. Give him another couple months of um, CMV prophylaxis until his absolute lymphocyte count is higher. Um, so even if you don't have access to those exotic CMV cellular immune assays, absolute lymphocyte count works really well. What about predicting uh, the risk of CMV at the end of treatment? So in the guidelines, we don't actually recommend secondary prophylaxis. It really doesn't work very well. Um, we do say that you could do some monitoring if needed, but we used to do a lot more secondary prophylaxis and we've largely moved away from that. Dipali Kumar's group in Toronto um, did a great job with the quantiferon CMV looking at um, 32, um, well, it was, sorry, 27 patients who um, had uh, CMV DNA emia, viremia, and who either had, and it was a mixed population as you can see here on the left, and it was either a positive cellular immune assay or a negative. Um, measured at the end of treatment. And she was able to show that people with a positive quantiferon CMV stayed free from CMV for the um, um, vast majority of people. And those who had a negative quantiferon CMV at the end of treatment had a very high risk of recurrent disease 
It's interesting because what they did was give an extra two months of secondary prophylaxis. And even with secondary prophylaxis, over 69% of these people develop recurrent CMV. So it is helpful for sort of triaging into the, like these people are gonna be okay arm. And then these people, we need to really watch them carefully. They will have reactivation disease, um, all of that. So these are two of my, they're small studies, but they're two of my favorites. This one by Dipali Kumar, and then the other one by Glenn Westall um, for duration of prophylaxis. If you want the bottom line on cellular immune assays, we recently had an American Society of Transplantation document published where basically we say that these assays for cellular immune response either may be useful or are less useful, but we don't come out recommending them. Um, and the bottom line is that there are insufficient data to support evidence-based guidance for the integration of CMV cellular immune assays into clinical routine clinical practice. So there you go. Okay, let's talk about treatment. Um, so treatment, and this comes straight from the guidelines, but this is our local protocol. So we either, we determine the severity of infection and the majority of our patients have mild to moderate CMV infection and we start oral valgancyclovir, as you can see on the left. For severe disease, life-threatening disease, retinitis, resistant refractory disease, really sick, sometimes severe malabsorption, we do admit them to the hospital for intravenous valgancyclovir renally adjusted, dosing, and then we convert to oral therapy when they're clinically improving. We also think about lowering the immune suppression. If they have hypogammaglobulinemia, for especially people with severe disease, we sometimes give CMV immunoglobulin or IVIG. We then go on and check weekly CMV DNA emia. We always trend on plasma um, on the same um, testing platform. And then we treat until uh, there are two negative or very low test results. You often won't get to negative with these ultra-sensitive tests. Um, and then we stop therapy. Um, and if the CMV DNA level doesn't fall after two to three weeks, we do recommend sending resistance testing. And just to know that we often see an increase when you're treating CMV, you often see an increase in DNAemia at one week and then a subsequent decline. So nobody worry if you see that increase at one week, people are all like, oh, this is resistant disease and there's always a lot of drama and they send $100 <laughs> of resistance testing and whatnot. Um, but that does not need to be done um, at one week. But it, by two to three weeks, you really should start seeing a decline in the DNA emia. Um, so that's an important, important teaching point. And then for some, once you've stopped therapy, especially for people on higher immune suppression or who are not previously immune, you may wish to do some monitoring after the end of treatment versus some people do get secondary prophylaxis. Hope that makes sense to everybody. One of the new, one of the new issues with um, CMV has been these ultra sensitive assays. And we see a lot of very low viral loads, you know, 45 IU per mil, like that's not bad. That's not CMV yet, like no drama there. Um, treatment is not always indicated with really low viral loads. Things to think about are like, what is the net state of immune suppression? Are they D plus or minus? What is the likelihood of major disease flare with waiting? Can you safely repeat testing in a week? Do they have risk factors for severe infection? And so retesting in a week is key um, so that you know which direction the infection is going if you've decided to not initiate treatment or if you have. Um, there is, this is one of the most uh, variable practices among transplant clinicians. And so I do think this is an area where we need to formalize guidance. Um, I see a lot of hectic things going on. I will say with really low viral loads, like below 500, Almost all the time, I just recommend um, repeat testing in a week. And Dipali Kumar and others have shown that many of these people will just clear virus on their own. Okay, and then I think one of the main reasons I was asked to speak was treatment of resistant refractory disease. So resistant refractory CMV really involves inadequate um, antiviral drug dosing or delivery, malabsorption or something, or for those who've had prolonged antiviral drug exposure, 
Also, those who've had prolonged um, active viral uh, replication, especially the D plus R minus population, or for people who've had strongly immunosuppressive therapy or who are on drugs with a lower barrier to resistance, it does look as though latumavir and maribavir develop um, antiviral resistance at much higher rates than either gancyclovir or valgancyclovir. The rates of resistance seem to be sort of highly variable, but published rates um, are sort of five to 12%, as high as 18% in lung recipients and up to a third of intestinal and multivisceral organ transplant recipients. Um, when we did prophylaxis in the IMPACT trial, looking at D plus R minus kidney transplant recipients with either 100 or 200 days of um, valgancyclovir, overall very low rates of resistance, zero to 3%. So good standard prophylaxis, you don't see a whole lot of resistance. If you are seeing a lot of resistance, it probably means you're underdosing or there's not compliance or some problems. Um, and then, uh, what is the um, definition of resistant refractory disease? Um, well, uh, so resistant is when there is the presence of a known viral genetic mutation that decreases the susceptibility to one or more CMV medications. Um, so that is when you send for resistance testing and they say, yes, you have a mutation. That doesn't happen all that much. So a lot of, we also created this definition of refractory CMV, and that partly relates to the testing issues and ability to detect the mutations. And so refractory CMV infection is when there are persistent signs and symptoms of CMV disease and or persistent CMV viremia that fails to improve by at least a log or that increases after at least two weeks of appropriately dosed antiviral therapy. So the new term is this resistant refractory CMV um, infection. And I find that this is clinically quite useful, especially because so many people do have resistant disease that where we don't detect a mutation. So um, in happy news, there is a novel therapy available with meribavir. Um, meribavir has now been approved in both the US and Europe for treatment, only for treatment of resistant refractory CMV after either solid organ or stem cell transplant. It is not otherwise approved for treatment outside of resistant refractory disease. Um, there was a phase three study looking at the use of meribavir compared to valgancyclovir um, in stem cell transplant recipients um, with, who were being monitored for preemptive uh, CMV with, and who developed asymptomatic CMV infection. But unfortunately, meribavir did not reach the trial endpoints um, in a press release that data is not published yet. So it's unlikely to move forward as prophylaxis um, and uh, due to historical reasons. And really important to know that with meribavir, so it's largely for resistant refractory disease at this point, and it's not for use in patients who have either CNS disease or retinitis. So that's, I put that in red, just that's an important area to know that you would want to use phoscarnet or another option if there were retinitis or CNS infection. Um, I don't think I'm going to go into the details of the mechanism of action for uh, meribavir. Um, it does have a novel mechanism of action, so it does not have significant overlap with um, other antiviral agents um, used for CMV. Um, and this is the phase three trial where we uh, looked at um, using it for resistant refractory disease. It was 235 patients, 40% stem cell recipients, 60% solid organ recipients. Um, and, uh, oops, I think, oh, right. Um, the comparison arm was investigator assigned therapy with either foscarnate, gancyclovir, valgancyclovir, sodofavir, or a combination thereof, but mostly foscarnate. Um, and, uh, Basically what was shown was that, um, and you can see this, so after eight weeks of therapy, um, 50, almost 56% of those who that got meribavir uh, cleared um, the, their CMV versus only 24% in the investigator assigned therapy arm, phoscarnate, gancyclovir, et cetera. And then therapy was stopped after eight weeks. And then you can see a pretty marked decline Although even by week 20, still twice as many patients who got meribavir had still cleared CMV um, 
and had cleared symptom control by week 20. So meribavir was still twice as good as investigator assigned therapy, but not really all that great overall. I mean, you wish these numbers were a lot more robust, which is frustrating. Um, and really what the study showed, overall good safety outcomes. Um, this, uh, the study showed that Marivavir was superior to investigator assigned therapy for CMV viremia clearance and uh, overall better outcomes, good safety profile. And it's great to have an orally bioavailable uh, therapy that doesn't require admission to the hospital for things like intravenous phoscarnate for these patients with resistant refractory disease. So this is, for me, this has been sort of a hallelujah moment but that we have a great alternative. Um, I've treated a couple patients in the past six months who had resistant refractory disease and they were all thrilled to be able to go home on pills. I do want to emphasize with um, the new therapies, both latemavir and meribavir, that they are just for CMV coverage. Um, and I think this is an important, I think my fellows always take a picture of this slide with their phones, so it must be a good slide. Um, I developed this just really for my own I self. I was having trouble keep, keeping track of everything. Um, but you can see that we've gotten, we've had good times with valgancyclovir covering CMV, HHV6, 8, HSV, VZV. But all of a sudden, the new drugs just cover CMV. So really important to remember that if you're using either latemavir or meribavir, those patients are probably um, at risk for reactivation of other human herpes viruses like zoster or HSV. So really important to think about using acyclovir, valacyclovir, or famvir in addition to. So I say these are actually, we should think of them as combination drugs in that we should give them with something else. And just to kind of close, I do want to describe a case of resistant refractory disease, one of those um, cases that I've been um, managing. So it was a 68-year-old woman who underwent kidney transplant for IgA nephropathy. She got antithymocyte globulin for induction. She was on triple immunosuppression. She was highly sensitized, so her dosing was higher. So already we know that she was 68, so a little older, antithymocyte globulin, highly sensitized, generous immune suppression. She was also D plus R minus. We had planned to give her valgancyclovir for six months. We did so, and then three weeks after the end of valgancyclovir prophylaxis, she developed significant CMV DNA emia. We started valgancyclovir treatment based on her GFR. We stopped the mycophenolate mofetil. She had a very low absolute lymphocyte count of 160, right? So this is kind of an ominous situation. Um, you can see here, so this is the end of her prophylaxis over here on the left in January. And then we were watching, well, her absolute lymphocyte count was here. You can see this is low and you're probably thinking, oh, that's bad. She said it had to be like, you know, well over 600. Otherwise you'll get CMV and especially this patient with multiple risk factors. And then, so three weeks after the end of prophylaxis, there you go, 564. So we're on our way up. There it is, 1100. She was appropriately started on valgancyclovir. Her numbers, as I mentioned, bumped up to from 1,000 up to 6,000. I said after a week of therapy, you often see that increase. If you think of it not as viremia, but as DNAemia, and if there might be a massive lysis of CMV or whatever, you're really just amplifying by PCR the DNA in the bloodstream. So this isn't really an increase in viremia per se, it's an increase in DNAemia, dead virus, live virus, who can tell? Anyway, you can see that a week later, she's coming to show she went from 1,000 to 6,000 to 3,000. So good response. And there she keeps falling, 400, 300. And then whoops, she's up to 1,700, hmm, 6,600, hmm, 7,700. And so I recommended that they send resistance testing. And um, they, no resistance mutation was found. She then went from 7,700 up to 14,000. We admitted her for what would be high dose intravenous gancyclovir. Given her GFR, that's like that's the equivalent of 10 mg per kg every 12 hours. She went from 14,000 to 25,000 to 57,000. So clearly going in the wrong direction. You can see the dense, deep lymphopenia here. And she was found on second testing to have the UL97 gancyclovir resistance mutation, which is a, one of the common canonical ones. 
the CE603W one. So she then was started, so we knew that Gancyclovir wasn't gonna work. We started her on Moribavir um, and added acyclovir for disseminated zoster. And you can see she went from 51,000 up to 67,000, again, a week into Moribavir treatment. And then she started falling and falling, falling, falling appropriately. So numbers are nice. She then started you know, a couple of months into treatment. She then hit 1,000, 2,000, 28,000. And she was found on repeat genotyping to have both that mutation she previously had along with a new Moribavir mutation. Her immune suppression was decreased. We kind of hoped for the best. And it turned out that with this rise in her absolute lymphocyte count, she was basically able to clear virus. And you can see her numbers were all quite low. Um, we thought about giving her latemivir for prophylaxis, but we didn't have insurance coverage, so we didn't give it. And basically, happy story, she did clear virus, even with subsequent development of resistance to moribavir. I think one of the nice things about moribavir is it doesn't have the cytopenia effect. So you can see that she actually was able to have this much more robust lymphocyte count on moribavir compared to val valgancyclovir. So I think that that helped her clear um, virus, which was wonderful. And she was thrilled and she's done really well. So she did have multiple risk factors for resistant virus. Um, as I outlined, even with carefully dosed valgancyclovir prophylaxis, we can have issues with resistance. That really low absolute lymphocyte count at the end of pro uh, prophylaxis does predict the risk of problematic CMV. And you know, in hindsight, should we have given her longer prophylaxis? Should we have used a different agent? Um, should we have done latemivir plus acyclovir? Um, and clearly in this case, and also that phase three trial and the phase two trial, merovivir definitely helped clear the DNA emia, but there's still a risk of resistance um, developing. This does seem to allow the return of lymphocytes and without, as there's no significant bone marrow suppression. So that's good news and it's great to have this alternative. We recently, if you're really interested in resistant refractory disease, um, we recently developed um, um, an online clinical decision support tool that you can see on the right. This was based on what we'd published for management of resistant refractory disease in the CMV guidelines. And several of the authors of the CMV guidelines got together and modified this to include the use of moribavir. So if you have a case of resistant refractory disease, either an organ transplant or stem cell transplant, you're welcome to use the clinical decision support tool. I hope you find it useful. If you have feedback for me, I would love, love to have feedback. Um, we did try to make it as user-friendly as possible. So just overall, um, Conclusions from my talk are that CMP prevention is really imperative for best outcomes. Valgancyclovir has really been the cornerstone of um, good prevention for over 20 years. Um, although it's interesting now that we will not have the patient assistance program that we've had for a long time. So that I think will be problematic. We're probably going to do more preemptive therapy monitoring. Um, and then the latemivir data does appear promising, but we'll see what the um, peer-reviewed publications look like and whether FDA approval comes and all of that. CMV diagnostics are really very important. The cellular immune assays are interesting, but sort of not really ready for prime time. They may emerge as helpful in the long run, but needs to be seen. And Meribavir shows good outcomes with minimal toxicity for management of resistant refractory disease. And it's great to have a new tool in the toolbox. And um, it's been a good um, several years now that we've had a bunch of new tools in the toolbox with um, the addition of Latemavir as well. And we hope that you find our clinical decision support tool useful. And I'm very happy, happy to have questions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Khan, for that wonderful talk. That was that was amazing. Um, I actually have a question. I have a patient who's on Moravivir right now, and I'm curious uh, what you would do in that patient who's on Moravivir right now if she becomes viremic again. What would be your next treatment option? So, do you mean viremic on Moravivir or off Moravivir or both? Uh, well, I guess both. Yeah, I'm just curious what the next option would be after. Uh, after Marabavir, knowing that she has a mutation? Yeah, it would probably be Foscarnet, which is really challenging. Um, yeah. It depends on the resistance mutation. 
I will say that those patients need to be managed really, really carefully because they can slip through your fingers. And the only cases of sort of death from CMV that I've seen in recent times is resistant refractory disease. So we want to make sure that we maximize all of our tools. I never use latemavir um, for treatment of resistant refractory disease. It's not a good treatment drug. It's a good prophylaxis drug, and it's not being developed for treatment. Merck is not proceeding with development. We see a lot of breakthrough. I don't think latemavir is a good option. And unfortunately, it becomes phoscarnate with all the associated you know, need to be admitted to hospital. And it's, boy, nephrotoxicity and, um, yeah, all the wasting of electrolytes and everything. So... You know, the other thing is that sometimes, as I showed, like when my patient developed resistant refractory disease, if we reduce the immune suppression, you can give things like CMV immunoglobulin, and sometimes you can get through that late phase. Um, I think that somebody actually called me about this patient that uh, I think one of the PAs actually called me, if that's the same patient, I don't know, kidney transplant recipient, kidney. Anyway. Um, yeah. I'm so sorry, that, are, you, are you referring to our, to our patient here? I think so. Somebody paged me. Oh, okay. Okay. Not sure. <laughs> I, I'll talk to anybody. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, like a month ago, maybe. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so unfortunately, although it depends on the resistance mutations, if you detect them, because as you get one mutation and then another mutation, it increases the risk that you the patient won't respond to whatever you're giving them. Challenging situations. Yes, very. That's that's actually the exact concern I have for, for this current patient. So thank you so much. Sure, sure. And I take a question in the chat. Do you have an experience or on combination of marubavir with leflutamide? So we would, we definitely do not recommend um, leflutamide. Leflutamide had this like brief, well, a decade ago, um, brief episode of being popular for um, management of resistant refractory CMV, but honestly, you don't reach the IC50 necessary and it's immunosuppressive by and of itself. And so we don't actually recommend the use of leflutamide. And so we- Everyone does. That's Sandhya's question. Um, sorry. Um, we don't recommend the use of leflunamide, but just it would just be marivavir alone. If it's severe resistant refractory disease, sometimes we give CMV immunoglobulin. Um, we really look hard at the immune suppression and know that this is at least a brief window of opportunity to clear virus. And maybe we could just briefly have them on lower dose immune suppression and then increase once they've cleared. These are hard cases. And I briefly mentioned that there are genetic risk factors I think that we have not fully uncovered who these patients are that develop resistant refractory disease or have really challenging CMV. There definitely are either genetic issues in the um, recipient or the donor that seem to really augment the risk of resistant refractory CMV. And it's almost like no matter what you do, it's really hard to get them to clear. We have maybe a couple of these patients per year at my hospital and I get to know them all really well. You said you've used this in combination in success in a patient. I think, yes, an N of one, we still wouldn't recommend it. And if you think that's great that it worked, but we wouldn't recommend, uh, it doesn't, um, it's kind of like ivermectin for COVID. Like it, it, the, it doesn't, it should, you don't reach the IC50. And so it's really not recommended that that be, that we don't recommend leflutamide just to be succinct. Hey, Dr. Cotton, yeah, thanks again for a great talk. I had the two questions, one quick one. Whatever happened to Brin Sidofavir? I know it looked promising early on. And then the second question is, what's your approach to this discussion of reduction of immunosuppression with a nephrologist or other specialists? You know, that part of the equation of treatment of the CMV, how involved do you get in that? Yeah, both excellent questions. So Bryn Sidofavir tragically is completely uh, not available for any, in any CMB context at this point. It was, um, it was being developed by a, a company in North Carolina called Chimerics, and it was actually sold to a company in Japan. And it's not clear what they're doing with it or what kind of um, further development, but it's not available in that context. Um, it had been 
being developed for adenovirus, and I have not heard that there are active trials in that field now, but you couldn't get it for, you won't be able to get it for CMV. It is actually obscure but true, approved for smallpox in the United States. So if you said that your patient had smallpox, not resistant refractory CMV, you might be able to get it, but I think that the authorities would rain down on you, so you probably would get caught. Just mostly kidding, right? Um, so it is interesting that it's approved, um, and they actually thought about it for monkeypox, but, and I don't know why it wasn't brought forward with monkeypox. It's also been, Prince it off of here is a beautiful like pan anti, um, anti DNA virus drug. It was like um, trovafloxacin or miropenem or something for, um, you know, broad coverage. But unfortunately the phase three trial was not well designed and it ended up, there's a lot of diarrhea in it in stem cell transplant recipients. And it basically showed a lack of efficacy, but really due to trial design. So many of us think it's a good CMV drug, but we just don't have access to it. So that's a great question, kind of heartbreaking. Um, I wish we had better access. And then, um, yeah, discussions about immune suppression. So I am a firm believer in really good relationships with between transplant and um, ID. We actually round every single day in the morning, um, every day of the year with abdominal transplant surgery, nephrology, hepatology, ID, nursing, discharge planning. We all round in one room every day. Those are actually my closest colleagues um, and people that I talk with sort of nonstop. And it's, hard because it is a bit of a arm wrestling with, I always want lower immune suppression and they usually would like higher, although they've sort of, um, they understand the need to reduce. I guess you never want to lose a patient to an infection when you could kind of, you know, briefly decrease their immune suppression. When we talk about decreasing immune suppression, we often are talking about brief um, intervals, not necessarily like forever. Um, although some, for some people it is the right answer to do it longer term, or some people are just left parked a little higher than they should have been. Um, so for me, it's about developing close relationships and just having that discussion. It is more arduous with some groups than others. I, I hope that answers your question. It, it's a hard discussion to have. I never touch the immune suppression myself. I always let transplant do it. Like I always say, can you please? reduce the immune suppression, but we never want patients to have, I always think with complex care um, and so many people involved, I usually want one person driving the bus. So I usually say, could you please consider reducing immune suppression? Um, usually we do okay. Um, yeah, it's a, it can be challenging though. And some groups more than, more than others. Thank you. Sure, good questions. Yeah, so, Dr. Dr. I just had one question and, you know, it, it goes back to your case that you uh, described with your um, resistant CMV. What I am, uh, I guess I'm not understanding is that the patient developed Meriburvi resistance while they, the, the, the viral load was going down and the lymphocyte count was going up despite that they developed resistance. I mean, that is something you rarely see in HIV, right? So because if the patient is, you know, uh, compliant with the ART and, you know, the CD4 count is going up and the viral load, although at low levels is go continuing to come down, they almost never develop resistance to that regimen. Yes, you are right. And that is, well, sometimes we think it's, you know, for HIV patients, they're often on a multi-drug regimen. There mm -hmm. is, for the first time ever, we're having discussions about should people be on multi-drug regimens for CMV? I mean, until recently, it was like, I mean, you weren't going to start Sadafavir or Foscarnet because they were too toxic. So it's probably the time when we can start to think about multi-drug regimens. And you're right that it is atypical, although I will say that I have had uh, two out of three cases of patients on meribavir develop meribavir, documented meribavir resistance. And in talking with colleagues na internationally, they have also seen development of meribavir resistance. 
So at, at significant rates, hmm. some of us are thinking that maybe we should do like a week of induction for um, significant resistant refractory CMV with phoscarnate and then switch to maribavir, like kind of really bring their viral load down and then switch to maribavir. But I will tell you, this is entirely expert opinion and anecdote. Um, but if it were me, if I had a high viral load with resistant refractory disease, believe it or not, I would want to be admitted for a week of phoscar week ten days of phoscarnet, and then switch to maribavir. So I like, but this is pure expert opinion. I per, most people though, most people in the maribavir trial had like viral like DNA emia of like ten thousand, like kind of these lower levels. So you're not really going to admit them for phoscarnet at that level. So it's really challenging, but we still see significant. Um, Resistance develop, although the resistance is not usually clinically significant until it is. Okay. And you all know the cases where you're like, oh, this is so bad. Like it's gone from bad to worse. And I get those emails and phone calls where it's like the person's kind of slipping through their fingers and there's not a lot to do. One thing I would really recommend, and I know I said this already, but is don't use latumavir for treatment because it really, it's like paper thin. Like it takes about five viral replication cycles in vitro to develop resistance to latemavir compared with about 30 for valgancyclovir. So it's really like paper thin as far as the resistance. But what I like saving latemavir for is secondary prophylaxis. So I'll do like, you know, either a phoscarnet or maribavir for resistant refractory disease. And then at the end, put them on latemavir for secondary or tertiary prophylaxis. And I think that's a real, that's like a sweet spot it's always hard when people are like, oh, I use the latumavir for treatment. I'm like, well, now we got nothing for, resist for you know, so that's my style. Um, and this is kind of style developed with a bunch of other experts, but um, it was amazing to do that phase three maribavir trial was, I can't even imagine the cost, but multiple content, I think, I think almost every continent was, okay, not Antarctica, but you know, the big con transplant continents were represented. It was huge to do that study. And we'd like a lot more data on management of resistant refractory disease, but given that it happens at like a couple cases for every institution, I don't think we're gonna have that data in, in the near future, which is makes it hard. And, and you know, to your point, uh, Dr. Gordon, once you know, you're done treating them, and then you, when, when, it's, when the time comes to switch them to Letermovir, is there a, a population like a, a certain transplant patient, like just say kidney transplant or any transplant patient can go on to letter movie? Because I know there was some, uh, like there was like the FDA approval was only for a few things and not much from what I remember. The FDA approval is only for stem cell transplant right now. Okay. So you could talk to your patient and say off-label use and mm -hmm. then which I think is reasonable. And there's this ID week abstract. And I think the phase three data are probably available through like clinicaltrials.gov. So like clinically, I think it's okay. The monster is that it's up close to $20,000 for three months. Okay. And as you know, that'll either go through insurance approval, like it just won't be blocked or it'll be blocked and then they'll say, this is not FDA approved. And then you'll say, well, do you really want me to put the you know, patient in the hospital and do like, you know, whatever, phoscarnet, or, I mean, other, well, other therapies, but you, you know, the, you know, the, yeah, the song and dance that we all do with these kind of um, very off-label use drugs that are expensive. Yeah. The cost of maribavir for eight weeks is about $48,000. Yes, you could drive that, <laughs> uh, like a pretty nice car or, <laughs> yes, so that's a, big issue, especially because there's going to be a push to use these drugs more and more. On the yeah. other hand, uh, several weeks of phoscarnet in the hospital is also very expensive. So anyway. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Lovely to see you all. I wish I were meeting you in person. Happy to have questions if I can be of service in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Gordon. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much. Bye. Nice to meet you Bye. all. Bye. Bye.